Thanks, Rabbi Seth. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for, for having us. Shabbat Shalom. And uh, yeah, so as Rabbi Seth mentioned, Jonathan and I, we started a YouTube channel and podcast recently called Two Messianic Jews. And as Jonathan and I, we've been deliberating about, you know, how we want to conduct ourselves with this channel. And we decided that we really wanted to conduct this channel in the same manner that we have been attempting to have conversations with, with many people who disagree with us over the last few years. And uh, a way to articulate that attitude, uh, we found uh, in a foundational principle that we like to say as pursuing truth is a greater goal than merely proving your point. And so from this principle sprouts many other principles that we will share with you all next week. But this week we wanted to exclusively focus on this idea because this really is the core of it. If you adopt this principle, you really find yourself doing what we'll talk about next week almost uh, accidentally. Um, and so adopting the posture of desiring truth more than merely proving ourselves right has been taking shape in me and Jonathan since about 2016 once we began to engage in a lot of religious and philosophical discussions in undergrad on campus and online. And it has also played a, a very dramatic role really, even in some of the really cool events we were able to host while in undergrad, uh, such as the debate we hosted between Dr. Michael Brown and Rabbi Daniel Freitag, a little bit more on that later on. Um, but the value of this principle has continued to show itself while in grad school and we strongly felt the desire to revolve two Messianic Jews around this principle explicitly. So we decided to make the top 12 guidelines for tough conversations as our first video to make sure everyone knows where we are coming from when discussing the, the tough issues we'll engage with. Um, so what do we mean by pursuing truth is greater than merely proving yourself right? So what we mean is this, the pursuit of truth is a transcendent goal that can unify two or more disagreeing parties. Rather than the discussion being the battering of two or more staunch conclusions, it can be an experimental exercise of synthesis and discovery involving the knowledge, perspective, and presentation of all views involved. Of course, a part of pursuing truth is attempting to articulate and prove your point, but this is no longer the end goal. It is a humble step in the process of pursuing truth. The goal is no longer to humiliate the opponent and to prove your brilliance, but for all participating to gain new knowledge, wisdom, and insight about the topic. And in addition, this creates an atmosphere in which discussing these tough controversial issues causes people to have more compassion and respect for others instead of causing division and the tendency to want to dehumanize those who disagree with us. And so adopting a posture in favor of pursuing truth, rather than merely proving ourselves right, I think is the path to honest conversation, careful thinking, and genuine reconciliation. And later on, Jonathan and I will both share a couple stories where we've experienced these things. And so in response to the video we made, uh, we got a lot of positive responses. And one of the responses we got was from a friend of ours. He reached out to Jonathan and he shared an article uh, written by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, and it, R Rabbi Sachs was describing Parsha Kora and how this principle is essentially, the one I was just describing, is essentially a core foundation of Judaism and rabbinic debate. So unbeknownst to us, the foundational principle we decided for two Messianic Jews is right in line with classic Jewish approaches to conversation and argumentation. And better yet, as we heard earlier in the service, Parsha Kora is the portion for this week. So with that, Jonathan will take us through the portion with an eye toward this idea. Absolutely. And yeah, I just want to say thank you again for, for having us. So excited to be here. Shabbat Shalom. And also, uh, I didn't talk to uh, Dr. Wexler before this, but he really uh, emphasized a point that I want to just go more in depth on. And that is the argument for the sake of heaven versus an argument not for the sake of heaven. And we see that this really is um, encapsulates what this principle that we're trying to um, explain, which is um, you're not just supposed to merely prove your point, you're trying to pursue truth. Pursuing truth is it's what's most important. So there's a clear difference between pursuing truth and merely proving your point. The rabbis called this 
an argument for, for the sake of heaven as opposed to an argument not for the sake of heaven. So the key text for this is Perkei Avot 517, which says, which is an argument for the sake of heaven? The argument between Hillel and Shammai, which is an argument not for the sake of heaven? The argument of Korach and his company. So the prime example of the principle we're um, explaining today comes from this week's Parsha. So going into the passage, uh, as Dr. Welkser was pointing out in Numbers 16, verse three, Korah and those with him, it says, they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, it is too much for you for the entire assembly. All of them are holy and Hashem among them. Why do you exalt yourselves over the congregation of Hashem? So we see there later in the passage that Moses responds to, to Korah in, in this way. He says, hear now offspring of Levi, is it not enough for you that the God of Israel has segregated you from the assembly to minister to them? And he drew you near and all your brethren, the offspring of Levi with you, yet you seek priesthood as well. So Korah is trying to show that he's appearing to be arguing for equality, demanding that there should be no distinction, no leadership, they should all be equal. But Moses is clear in pointing out what Korah is actually arguing and he's demanding to be the leader himself to rule Israel. He's not pursuing truth, he's trying to pursue power. And later Moses deals with the situation by declaring that God will reveal who Israel's leader. He will reveal that Moses is in place because God put him there, that Aaron is his place because God put him there. And the way he's going to prove this is by if Korah and his men are swallowed up alive and go down into the pit. And this is exactly what happens right after he explains this. But the people respond to Moses by saying, right after this happened, they says that they said, you have killed the people of Hashem in number 17, verse six. So the people aren't claiming that Moses was wrong, that God was not with Moses and that Aaron should not be the, the, the priest there. What he's saying there, what the people are saying is they're objecting to how Moses won the argument. So God deals with the situation by providing another way of responding to the people. He commands Moses to take staves from each leader of the tribes of Israel with their names inscribed on them and bring them to the tent of meeting. So Aaron's name is written on the staff from the tribe of Levi and his staff is budded and produced ripened almonds. And this was a signal to Israel that Moses was right in designating Aaron as the high priest. Moses was, God was with Moses. So Moses actually responds to Korah using, on Korah's own terms, using power, right? So, and God answers Moses' request for a miracle. He, he goes through with this. But God later responds to Korah alternatively by simply revealing the truth of the matter. So this is what the rabbis see in their account is the destructive nature of an argument not for the sake of heaven. So as, as Eric was mentioning, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, he makes the distinction between these, these, these two ways of arguing, and he calls it an argument for the sake of victory versus an argument for the sake of truth. And I, I think that's crucial. The way Sachs uh, puts it, he ta talks about an argument for the sake of victory as this. What is at stake is not truth, but power. And the result is that both sides suffer. Even a Moses is brought low, laying himself open to the charge that, quote, you have killed the Lord's people. The opposite is the case when, he, when the argument is for the sake of truth. If I win, I win. But if I lose, I also win because being defeated by the truth is the only form of defeat that is also a victory. And I really think Sachs makes a great point here. And that is, if we're pursuing truth and we lose the argument, right? We're, we're shown that our position is wrong. We, we actually still win because we're getting closer to that truth. But if we are only pursuing victory and we win the argument, yeah, we may have won, but we're destroying our opponent in the process. We're, de we're destroying the person rather than just the argument. And so that's what happens with Moses. Moses won the argument, but in the first way he, he responds to the situation, he destroys Korah in the process. So th think about it this way. We're, we're, we're living in a world with all kinds of um, arguments that could be taking place, with all kinds of tough conversations that, are, that could be happening and are happening. Um, uh, Dr. Seth, uh, Rabbi Seth mentioned a, a, a number of um, examples of the things that we're dealing with today. And the question is, how will we argue? Are we approaching conversations only to prove that we're right? Or are we pursuing truth, attempting to get closer to that truth with our conversation partner or partners? I think what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 through 5 is, is really important here. 
And he says, we destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Messiah. So Paul explains that, yes, we should be destroying arguments, right? If, if there's a bad argument, we should be destroying it. But what the Parsha reveals to us is that when we're engaged in these tough conversations, the goal of both parties should be to pursue truth. So this will involve destroying terrible arguments, but not destroying people in the process. And, and that's really tough, right? Destroying arguments of another person and being open to the destruction of your own while giving them complete respect, it's really difficult, seriously difficult. But this is something we should strive for. We're, we cannot sacrifice love over truth or truth over love, but we need to love people while teaching them the truth, while explaining to them and telling them the truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know this principle, you know, it could sound very abstract and theoretical, but when you adopt it, and this is, it's kind of hard to explain this, but when you adopt it, you really feel it mentally and physically in a really real way. Like there's something that happens where tensions ease away, guards come down, genuine conversation flows, and you hear new exciting ideas and angles. True progress is made, and not only that, but true relationships are made. Tough conversations that usually cause stress can actually be relaxing and enjoyable. Or maybe, maybe that's just me and Jonathan being a little strange, uh, but the potential for the, these tough conversations to be relaxing is there. And next week, we will talk more about the principles that have a very similar effect. Uh, they may be abstract in nature, but when adopted and adhered to, they manifest themselves in a very real way and totally change the tone and atmosphere surrounding the conversation or even when doing independent research. And so uh, I kind of just want to share some stories uh, that at least show me that this isn't just something that I'm only experiencing because I'm adopting uh, this principle, but this principle uh, when I can. Uh, but other people are noticing that it changes the atmosphere in, in a very tangible manner. And so when I was an undergrad, uh, me and Jonathan, we used to set up tables and we would like have a question like on a whiteboard and people would just come up and we would have conversations on a variety of issues. And so we were doing this one day and uh, I started having a conversation and I think he was an agnostic, if I remember correctly. And we ended up not, we didn't even talk about whatever question was on the board. But he started asking me about what I thought about uh, the, what the New Testament taught about homosexuality. So that's obviously a, a tough and controversial uh, conversation. But luckily, you know, it's, it's something I'm not always successful in. But luckily, during this conversation, I was able to uh, remember this principle and adhere to it and let it guide uh, how I spoke. And by the end of it, he said, I wish more Christians talked the way you talk. Um, so of course, you know, I didn't really get into the whole Christian versus Messianic Jewish thing, but anyway, he totally was able to perceive that, uh, I was able to talk in a, in a way that really, uh, caused a genuinely positive reaction. And it was a tough conversation that he would have liked to have more of. And so I thought that was really, that was really cool. And so, um, as you do begin to adopt this, um, attitude one of the challenges in continuing to adopt it is when you begin to feel that you're the only one who, who's doing this and you're trying to do it but then the person you're talking to is you know becoming you know belligerent and just trying to prove your point and you know those are often the moments where i where i do fail <laughs> at keeping hold to this principle um but luckily there was this conversation i was having uh in undergrad again just like in the lobby of of a building and I was just sitting and studying or something. And a member of the Atheist Club on campus, who I've spoken with previously, um, came up to me and he kind of had the reputation of being belligerent and arrogant and definitely very <clears throat> confident to say the least in, in how he spoke. Um, and so we started talking about whether God exists and the problem of, problem of evil and all kinds of stuff. And he was just speaking in his typical belligerent uh, manner. But luckily, I was able to successfully just try really hard to lead by example and let this principle guide how I spoke and how I responded. And during the, 
during the conversation, like I saw this happen before my eyes, uh, he started to mirror my attitude. And by the end of it, you know, he might have been even more calm and reasonable than, than I was being. And it was just this really cool moment where by the time he left, somebody who was uh, overhearing our conversation felt compelled to say to me like, wow, that was like one of the best conversations I've, I've ever heard. And so um, I just think those are like some examples that I think uh, show that something just very real happens when um, you have this change in attitude. And not only that, but as I mentioned, it really affects how you do your own independent research if you're just conversing with you know, authors or, or speakers. And many of the most exciting ideas that I currently hold to are from those who I have major disagreements with, uh, such as the, something as core as like the, vali the validity of the Messianic Jewish lifestyle. So very soon after I came to faith and started asking myself big questions about you know, faith and Messianic Judaism, I very quickly started to question whether like this is like the way I'm supposed to live my life. Like what does the New Testament say about Torah observance and, and living as a Jew, as a Jewish believer? And so in addition to reading Messianic Jews like David Stern and others, I started reading the work of non-Messianic Jewish scholars such as Mark Nanos and Paula Fredrickson. And so of course I have, there's areas where I dramatically dis disagree with them, but when I adopted this attitude, I was able to notice the parts that I do agree with, and they have dram dramatically impacted in a very positive way my identity as a Messianic Jew. And so if I was only concerned with refuting them where I disagreed, I never would have experienced the blessings in my life their work has provided me. So again, just adopting this principle truly transforms how you receive and respond to the ideas of others. For sure. And um, another example for just in my life, um, how employing this principle has really changed attitudes is back in 2017, the organization that Eric and I were running at Kennesaw, um, we, were, we were trying to put together a debate between an Orthodox Jewish rabbi and Dr. Michael Brown on the question, is Jesus the Jewish Messiah? So it was fantastic because we found an Orthodox Jewish lawyer who was willing to, to debate Dr. Brown. I think the book was called, he wrote 26 Reasons Why Jews Don't Believe in Jesus. And we had the debate planned for six months. And what happened was the Monday, the week of the debate, I received a call from his wife saying, uh, Mr. Norman is uh, too ill to travel. He can't, he can't participate in the debate. And that was probably the most stressful 24 hours of my life, trying to find a replacement um, to debate Dr. Brown. And I was able, God, God works, and uh, I was able to be on the phone with a local rabbi, Orthodox rabbi, uh, Rabbi Daniel Freitag. Um, and he was considering, do it, considering stepping in. The, this event was advertised in the Atlanta Jewish Times. The Jewish community was coming. The Christian community was coming. Kennesaw was coming. And, um, you know, we, he wanted to potentially step in, but he was hesitant. And so one of the things I told him getting to know him on the phone, and I said, I'm a Messianic Jew, the vice president of this organization, he's also a Messianic Jew. And I'm really, I'm more concerned in pursuing truth than just proving myself right. So if you could show me that, say, that Yeshua is not the Messiah, that your, your Orthodox Judaism is the truth, I will leave my faith, I will join you. And because truth is most important to me. And when I said that, the tone of the conversation changed, the atmosphere changed. And it, from there, we just kind of talked about the plans to go through with um, you know, the structure of it and the plans. He actually was going to be uh, giving his son's bar mitzvah. Uh, he was going to be running his son's bar mitzvah that very week and the next day. And he still did it. It was fantastic. But um, yeah, so it just, it changes the, the tone of the conversation because it's all about pursuing truth. It's not just, I'm here to prove you wrong. It's, I want to know what truth actually is. Another thing is, Back um, many, m most years, I, I've been going to Messiah Conference in uh, Pennsylvania. And one of my favorite parts of the conference, it's, it's most not anyone's part, favorite part, but for Eric and I, this is my favorite part. Um, we go to the Jews for Judaism tent. They've been coming there for 40 years. They're a counter missionary organization out there to basically pull Messianic Jews out of Messianic Judaism and into embracing um, what, what they believe is, is the truth. And these are, I've seen videos of this, People get into very heated debates, very um, things, terrible things happen sometimes. But I go down there to engage in tough conversations, but it's really just 
honestly a relaxing, enjoyable conversation. We just sit down there, hang out. They bring food. It was a lot of fun. But um, I just noticed that by employing this principle of pursuing truth, rather than just proving yourself right or just making sure your point is made, it just changes the tone of the conversation to the point that even one of the, of the counter missionaries there who I got to know, when he made a point that I was going back and forth with him on, he actually said to me, I have no evidence for my position on a point that we were, we were discussing about Yeshua. And I think he said that because he had a mutual, there was a mutual respect. I respected him, he respected me, and we were able to be honest with each other. And it just turns out just to be a great conversation. It's not about destroying the person, it's about wrestling with these arguments and pursuing truth together in community. And so I want to end um, just by saying, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's not about you, it's about the truth. And what Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says, I think is, is really um, significant, it's crucial, relating back to the Parsha. He says, the story of Korach remains the classic example of how argument can be dishonored. The schools of Hillel and Shammai remind us that there is another way. Argument for the sake of heaven is one of Judaism's noblest ideals. Conflict resolution by honoring both sides of the conflict and by humility in the pursuit of truth. 